Every Man an Enemy by W. Howard Baker. Chapter 17. But wherever she goes, Herbert Asbury goes. Carla began, and then stopped. Blake didn't say anything. But why should he attack me? To kill me, you said? Why should Herbert Asbury... Again, Carla's voice trailed off into silence. She was bewildered. Blake said abruptly, Let's go back downstairs. You take Millie. But you haven't answered any of my questions. I'll answer them soon, Blake promised her. I'll answer them very soon, indeed. His voice was sure. Come along, he said, and Carla bent down to pick Millie up, but Millie wasn't going to be picked up. Millie was very annoyed. When she'd come up on the roof, she'd been a little tight, and she'd been feeling very affectionate, and what had she got for showing her affection? She'd got herself kicked. That's what she'd got. Millie didn't like being kicked. She didn't have to take that kind of treatment from anyone. Not anyone. She'd leave Herbert flat just up and walk out on him before she'd take that kind of treatment from him. Tail twitching ferociously, she eluded Carla's grasp, hissed in her throat, spat a couple of times, and then turned and stalked towards the head of the stairs. She wouldn't let anyone carry her, not anyone, not in her present murderous mood. She stalked ahead of them, stiff-legged. Come along, Blake said to Carla, and both of them followed Millie down off the roof and into the house. Just ten minutes later, Blake held the floor. He was speaking coldly, incisively. He was standing in the centre of the library, directly under the lights. The others were grouped all around him, sitting on low chairs, some comfortably, some uncomfortably. John Bovis and Harvey Innes, Splash Kirby and Herbert Asbury, Tinker and Prout. Blake had talked to Inspector Trooper, and then had called them all together. He hadn't let any of them speak to Carla. He'd watched them all carefully, eyed them closely, as they passed her on their way into the room. Which of them had attacked her? Which of them was the murderer he and the police were seeking? Blake thought he knew. He had not even allowed John Bovis to speak to Carla. He had wanted nothing to detract from the impact of what he had to say. So now he stood under the lights looking at them, letting his hard grey eyes range over them, and in a chair by the door Inspector Trooper sat back and stretched his thick legs, easing his bulk, but all the while he watched Blake very closely. The others in the room were no less intent. None of them saw Millie enter the room. None of them noticed her walk in, tail high, eyes bitter. She skirted the company silently as Blake continued to speak. She reached Prout, and then everybody heard her. Nobody could fail to notice her then. Her back arched, her hair came erect. She laid back her ears, and her eyes were evil. She spat at him. Herbert Asbury was alarmed. Millie, Millie, what's the matter? He tried to take her into his arms, but she evaded capture. She jumped away and ran to Blake. She sat down at his feet and regarded the other people in the room with a baleful eye, Prout particularly. He was making little clucking noises in her direction now. Let him cluck, fool. Did he think he could get around her that easily? And Herbert was regarding her anxiously. He was looking from Blake to her and back again. He was looking very anxious indeed. If he got up and tried to catch her, he'd have to chase her all round the room, and even then she'd spit in his eye, and how would he like that? Her tail twitched viciously. Above her, Blake said, We're all here now. Everyone with a part in this case, Millie included. We've even got a multiple murderer here, and I'm going to speak directly to him. He paused, and there was a perceptible movement throughout the room. Men shifted in their chairs. One man waited uneasily. Blake's eyes ranged over them all. Then, it's time to bring this business to an abrupt end, he said. That's my Christmas message to the murderer among us. Confess. Own up to your crimes. This mad holiday of slaughter has gone on long enough. And he paused again, but this time nobody moved. No one at all. Nobody moved and nobody smoked. It almost seemed as if nobody breathed. There was a cold, bitter silence, and into this silence Blake spoke again, tautly. All right, so you're not going to confess. I didn't really think that you would. You're hoping against hope that I can't put my hand on you. You're going to make me come and get you, eh? Very well, I'll oblige you with pleasure. And Sexton Blake moved. He pivoted quickly. He was standing directly in front of John Bovis and Prout. He looked from one to the other. Then he said, John? And he said it so sharply that John Bovis jumped. John, where were you on Christmas Eve? John Bovis looked nervous, 
and his voice rasped out harshly. Christmas Eve? What do you mean? When? When? What time on Christmas? We're all here. One of us wasn't, Blake said. Not after Dr. Carlton, alias Leon Kestrel, had left. One of us followed Kestrel and Mackintosh out, waited for Mackintosh to come back alone. But surely you can't mean that you suspect me of murder, Bovis blustered. This is ridiculous. Where were you, John? He was with me, Carla said quickly. Blake didn't look at her. He didn't shift his gaze from the publisher's face. All of the time? Now Bovis sounded ungracious. From the time that Mackintosh left until we both went to bed, yes. And when was that? When we went to bed, Bovis grumbled. Around midnight, I suppose. More than two hours after Kestrel left with Jimmy Mackintosh. I suppose so, Bovis said shortly. And you never left Carla's side all of that time? You never went outside, for instance? Of course not. Why should I? Blake looked at Carla and she nodded her head. So, Blake said, it boils down to this. Unless there was and still is collusion between you and Miss Scott, you had no opportunity to kill Jimmy McIntosh. More than that, John Bovis retorted with some asperity. I have no motive to kill him, no damn motive at all. I defy you to show me a motive. Now, now, Blake said gently but warningly. Don't tempt me, John, but let's go back a little further. You met us all at Bourne End Railway Station when we came down here. Where were you a quarter of an hour before you met us? Where were you at the time that Lavinia Webb must have been tumbling out of that train? Why, here, I suppose. Yes, I was here. And again, Miss Scott was with you. Naturally. The answer was short. Then Blake said very quietly, John, can you prove it? And Bovis exploded. Prove it, hell's teeth, man. Can you, John? Of course I can, if you'll take the word of half a dozen servants. Of course, said Blake equably. I'll settle for that. So you couldn't have pushed Lavinia Webb out of the train. I couldn't and didn't, Bovis said forcefully. And Blake inclined his head briefly. That clears you, John. He looked at Inspector Trooper. He said, we're only looking for one murderer, one killer for all three crimes, Fawcett, Mackintosh and Lavinia Webb. If Mr Bovis's alibi is as strong as it sounds, Trooper agreed, it would seem to let him out. Bovis's moustache could be seen to be bristling. Thank you very much. So, Blake said, we'll move on. He paused and swung round. We'll move on to Mr Herbert Asbury and Mr Prout. Prout's head came up as his name was mentioned. He regarded Blake through hostile, truculent eyes. You call this detection? I call it a farce. Bear with me a little while, Mr Prout, Blake said. I promise you that you won't be disappointed. You want to know where I was when Lavinia Webb was pushed up the train? I know where you were, Blake said. You were in the same coach, a corridor coach, and you could easily have done the pushing. But, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking for one killer for all three murders. So let's take a look at what you were doing at the time Macintosh was taking his fatal fall down the well. I don't know what I was doing. Does that make me the killer you're looking for? I think, Blake observed calmly, that you might even enjoy being the killer we're looking for. It will put you in the centre of the stage and give you an opportunity to glory in being important for once. To date, the only people you've been important to are cats. What about my landlady, then? Prout demanded. You know best what she is, Blake observed. But I repeat, the only people you've been important to so far are cats, and that's only because they are allergic to you for some unknown reason. I certainly am not going to oblige you by trying to make you the central figure in a murder trial. Fortunately, or unfortunately for you, I can personally provide you with an alibi for the time Jimmy McIntosh was killed. You were within my sight for the whole of the vital period. You couldn't have pushed Mackintosh down the well. And that lets you out, I think. Once more, Blake paused. Then, this leads me remorselessly on to Herbert Asbury, he said. The room was very still. Almost everyone in it was looking at Asbury. Wasn't he the only suspect left? And the fat little man ran a finger around the inside of his collar, a collar 
that seemed to have suddenly grown very tight around his neck. He was sweating. His glasses were steamed over. He said tremulously, I, I didn't do it. I didn't do any of it. His voice climbed to a squeak. Words which have hanged many a man before now, Blake observed. And then, as eyes swung round to fix hard upon him, he added, Happily, Mr. Asbury, I believe you. And you want to know why I believe you? I believe you, because I do not think you could, or would, kick a cat. Kick a cat, Asbury echoed faintly. This cat, Blake said, this Siamese cat here, Millie. I thought you were trying to find the murderer. What has Millie Asbury broke off? He groped for a handkerchief, mopped at his forehead. I don't understand. Blake smiled at him, then ignored him. He said, My junior partner and myself have nothing whatever to gain from any of these crimes. But what about my friend Kirby? The journalist eyed him severely. Call yourself a pal, he said bitterly. When all the time you've been measuring me up for a life sentence, he snorted. I'm very happy to tell you, he went on, that I've got a cast-iron alibi for the time force it was killed. I wasn't even in the country, I was in Paris. I didn't even get back to London Airport until two hours after he'd had his cocoa, to coin a phrase. And that, I think, takes care of me as a star suspect. You said yourself, Blake, you're only looking for one killer, one man for all the three crimes. Wait a minute, said Prout. Why does it have to be a man, eh? Tell me that. Blake looked at him thoughtfully. Thinking of Miss Scott? She's as likely a suspect as any of the rest of us. That's preposterous, John Bovis was on his feet. That's sheer madness, Blake. Carla, commit those crimes. I agree with you, Blake said. Carla couldn't have committed any one of those crimes, and you know why? She had the best of all reasons not to. She had no need to murder to get MacDonald Hall's money, because that's just what she is. What? Huh? I, I don't follow, said Bovis. Carla Scott is MacDonald Hall, Blake said firmly, and his eyes ranged the room. So why should she do murder to get money which is hers by right? MacDonald Hall? Who, <laughs> Carla? John Bovis seemed to sag visibly. He breathed, I don't believe it. Hers? By right? Stuff and nonsense! Harvey Innes was on his feet. You do well not to believe it, Mr. Bovis. She isn't MacDonald Hall. I am, and I can prove it. You are? Now Bovis looked more dazed than ever. I've held back until now to give the publicity a chance to build up to sell more books for you, John, Innes said, and for myself, of course. And he laughed shortly, confidently. The whole thing... It's just been one big publicity stunt on my part. But the time has come for me to speak. I'm not hiding the fact any longer. I am MacDonald Hall, and... And you have a carbon copy of the manuscript of Six Pillows to Midnight to prove it, Blake said. Yes, I know. Thank you for reminding me that you're still with us, Mr Innes. Thank you for drawing attention to yourself. Look at him, everybody. If you want to see what a multiple murderer looks like. Harvey Innes went white. You mind what you're saying, Blake? His mouth twisted. There's such a thing as a law against slander, you know. There are laws against killing, too. You've had a very long run, Innes. But do you want to know what put me on to you? A sentence. One typewritten sentence. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. You're mad. I don't know what you're talking about. Harvey Innes' eyes glittered dangerously. You're insane. You're the unbalanced one, Harvey, Blake said. You've been mad quite a while ever since you first thought out this little scheme of yours, ever since you first thought you could get away with it, this proof that you speak of, this carbon copy of the manuscript of Six Pillows to Midnight, you stole it from Carla Scott, and you were the only person beside myself who knew that she had it. And how did you know, Innes? I'll tell you. Blake's voice came out strongly. You knew because you had a letter from MacDonald Hall. It came with the manuscript. It was typed on Carla Scott's portable. You used that machine today, and you stumbled on that fact. You even typed out the test sentence, which embraces the whole alphabet to check the alignment with the letter you'd had from MacDonald Hall, and which you've still got in your possession. You found that the alignment and imprint were identical, and then you knew. 
His voice rose accusingly. That was when you stole the carbon copy of the manuscript. That was when you tried to get rid of Miss Scott when you tried to kill her by throwing her off the roof. You're crazy, Harvey Innes got out. You're making it up. Carla saw your face, Innes, Blake said. When he was playing a card, he didn't possess. But he bluffed, like a master. Carla Scott saw your face as you ran away. He broke off to shout a warning. Hold him, Tinker! For something within Harvey Innes had snapped. He was showing his guilt very plainly now in the way he struggled and scratched and tried to claw away to the door into freedom. He never reached it. Tinker held him. Trooper came to his assistance, and the inspector was big, and he was burly, and he moved surprisingly fast for a man of his bulk. Millie got up too. She got to her feet and she stretched, and she carefully padded across the room. She picked her spot and she sank her teeth into it. She bit Harvey Innes's leg. She drew blood, and Innes yelled. Millie's eyes glittered. Honour, she thought, was now satisfied. Kick her, would he? The cur. She found Herbert Asbury amidst all the commotion and leapt for his arms. She settled her head on his shoulder. She began to purr. 